Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, church. <laughs> what a glorious morning it is. Amen. 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 Well, we're in Jesus' letter to the churches, the book of Revelation. And in that letter, he addressed seven churches in particular. Those seven churches represent all of us, all the churches that there are today and the church through the church age. I'd like to start with the last uh, part of this letter to the church at Thyatira today, and that is verse 29. How about we start with this instead of end with this? Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. That will work at the beginning too, won't it? So we want to be, we want to be spiritually alert. Jesus says, understand what I am saying in these letters. Understand what I'm saying to you. And remember, we're trying to look to see where we are spoken to as the Broadway Church. Where we are spoken to in these letters. So, right up front, are we like the church in Thyatira? Hmm. <clears throat> the church in Thyatira. Now, we started out with the church in Ephesus, and we remember it because it was the church that lost its first love. And then we looked, we went farther north and we found um, the church in Smyrna and they were the church that was persecuted. Then we looked last week at the church in Pergamum and that church we can see as the church that was compromising. And I'll tell you right up front, the church at Thyatira is known as the adulterous church. Verse 18, Revelation chapter 2, Jesus said, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. Who is this Son of God? None other than our Jesus. Amen. The Lamb who someday will come as the Lion, the Son of God. Do you know that this is the only time uh, that phrase is used to describe Jesus in the whole book of Revelation? He has many titles in the book of Revelation, but this is the only time uh, that he calls himself the Son of God. Why did he need to do that, use that title for the church in Thyatira? Well, I believe as God, they needed to see Him as God. They needed to know that He's the one who has authority over them. Eyes like flames, uh, a flame of fire. Let's take a look at that. We have something? Yeah. Now, what, what do you think that symbolizes? Jesus with eyes like flames of fire. You, can you see those eyes looking at you? See, he, un, I mean, that's a, that's a bright light. They didn't have a, a, a flashlights in, in those days or, or electric lights of any kind. No one, when they want to describe brightness, it was fire, flames of fire. He sees, he understands, he knows your secret thoughts. What you're thinking right now, He knows. Do you believe that? And we know it's so. In fact, if we went down to verse 23, it expounds on it a little bit. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every, every person. In the King James it says there, he searches the reins, the reins or the thoughts. I like that word reins, you know, because we use reins to guide a horse, right? Use the reins to guide a horse. And the horse then moves the wagon 
Isn't that true? And so, he knows what moves your wagon. <laughs> he does. He knows your intentions. He knows mine. Then it said he has feet like brass. Now, that's him describing himself. Feet like brass. Strong. Steadfast he is. And those feet like brass are supporting his kingdom. He's enforcing his government. And he'll do it well. Let's pray. Father, some of us have thoughts who are, that are one, wandering all over the place right now. And we're asking you, because all things are possible with you, to help us tune in with your Spirit, who is here right now, in every believer, amongst us in this place of worship. And we come and sit before you, Father God, because we absolutely need to hear your Word. We hear so many voices in this world around us. We need to sort your voice out of them all. Today, help us to hear your word with what we need to hear. And please anoint this teacher. Please keep me faithful. In Jesus' name. And the believers said, Amen. Amen. Now, the church at Thyatira, they had some strengths like the other churches did. A little bit about the, uh, the city. It wasn't really what you'd call a city. It was the smallest uh, city of the seven that we're looking at. It was a blue-collar town. You know, if, if they were uh, around today, it'd be the ones who have a lot of factories. They had a military uh, garrison there in the city. They were known as a city of trade, therefore. Uh, they dyed purple. Uh, we, we, we take for granted all these different colors that we get today, but in that day it, didn't, it wasn't that easy. Uh, but uh, Thyatira, uh, many people there, they had altar guilds, and, and they, uh, they dyed uh, cloth purple and then shipped that cloth all, all over the civilized world. In fact, uh, the first convert there in Thyatira is said to be Lydia, that uh, Paul led Lydia uh, to the Lord. And the Scriptures tell us clearly she's one who, uh, who uh, dyed uh, cloth purple. This church in Thyatira had some wonderful strengths. Let's look at verse 19. Before I get going any farther... The uh, prophetic application, that means uh, this church and their strengths and weaknesses generally represented the church in the church age from the year about 590 to about the year 1517. So over about a thousand year period, the church as a whole, generally speaking, might have been what Jesus looked at as the adulterous church. All right, back to verse 19. I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Boy, they had some wonderful strengths, didn't they? And he said they were growing. Growing in what? Growing in, first of all, love, growing in faith, growing in service, and growing in persistence or endurance. Love and faith, right at the top of the list of their, of their good qualities. Now, aren't these two the real goals of God's commandments? If we were to follow, if we were to just um, operate in love and faith, then we'd be automatically following all of God's commandments, wouldn't we? And that's what should be produced in every believer, therefore. Doesn't this sound like the ideal church to you? Love, faith, service, endurance, patiently enduring uh, whatever they need to go through. 
Sounds like the ideal church? Love, right at the top of the list. Love leading to service. You know, if you, if you love something or someone, uh, then you tend to go all out. For example, if uh, you love football, then uh, you probably have the game recorded today. <clears throat> or uh, you, you want to uh, be close enough to the game that you volunteer. Maybe you're, you'd be a coach, assistant coach. You'd work on the sidelines or, or uh, selling food. You just have to be around it if you loved football. In other words, love drives you to serve what you love. If you loved beer, I was, right, I was on a plane from Toronto to Pittsburgh one time and sat down beside this guy and started up a conversation and uh, found out he was on his way to a beer judging contest. He was a judge of beer. And so uh, they were, it was a place they were in, in Pittsburgh, they're going to have a bunch of homemade beers. He was a judge. He's probably about 35 years old and considered a pro at this, judging beer. I says, do you like beer? He says, I love beer. <laughs> <clears throat> well, when you love something, you tend to get pretty attached to it. You want to be around it. I did my share of guzzling a long time ago. No more. If you love children, I think you'll end up in the ministry of the church somehow, somewhere with kids. You'll be serving them somehow if you love children. <clears throat> what we learn here, the Thyatirans, their love motiv motivated them to serve. That was their high qualities. Now, if we think back to the Ephesian church, Remember, that was the church that had good doctrine. What they were believing was right on. But you know what? That good doctrine didn't drive or motivate them to serve. It's love that motivates you to serve. Hmm. Verse 20, But I have this complaint against you. Oh, they aren't the perfect church. You are permitting that woman... That Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I want to tell you, the churches we've looked at so far, the church in Thyatira had the worst sins yet. They were allowing false teaching. And, and not like the uh, church at Pergamum who just tolerated it. Church at Pergamum was teaching their, keeping their doctrine correct, and they were tolerating others who were uh, teaching false stuff and living that way. But at Thyatira, this is what, had happened, this is what would have happened to Pergamum if they didn't repent. They would turn into the church like Thyatira. They were not only allowing the false teaching, they were supporting the false teaching. An example of that might be, is what's going on in the United Methodist Church today. We have a group of people who want to change our doctrine on marriage. And they want that changed doctrine uh, to be what is supported by everyone in every church the church in Thyatira. And who was, it, who was spearheading this in their church? Um, uh, this Jezebel. You all familiar with that name, uh, Jezebel? How many of you have relatives named Jezebel? Anyone here name, <laughs> name your kid Jezebel? <laughs> it would be like naming him Hitler, huh? <laughs> now, was this a real person, this Jezebel, someone named Jezebel in the Thyatira church? I don't know. I don't think so. 
I think Jesus was using this as a, uh, as a title, a symbolic title to this woman who was actually operating in the church, teaching false things and living that lifestyle. I remember in my first church, um, rookie pastor met with the uh, staff parish relations committee uh, probably oh just a few months into my into our stay there sat down with them of course they all know this is my first appointment and they said uh, uh, one of the guys well, there's a couple uh, mature Christians there one one was a, a, re a retired pastor and um, he said, uh, I'd like to check your sermons before you preach them on Sunday, Pastor. <clears throat> and I thought, I didn't say it out loud, but I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I says, I think God sent me here. I says, I don't have much experience, but I know God sent me here. And, um, and I don't think that's a good precedent. Um, it's, it's, uh, to me, it was like... Uh, him wanting to control through me the teachings in the church. Now, he continued with that attitude along with a couple other leaders in the church for a few years. And then after about, we were there in nine years. After about five years went by, this, now he's, he's a good man of God. After about five years went by, he came to me and he says, Pastor, Will you please forgive me? He says, I want to tell you, I want to confess to you that I have been controlled by a Jezebel spirit. And that spirit was trying to use me to control you. Jezebel. See, to understand this sin, we go to the Old Testament as we do for deeper understanding and uh, into all the things of God. Who was the Jezebel uh, that was back in the day uh, when uh, Israel was the, uh, when they had the divided kingdom, you know, after David, after Solomon, and then, then Solomon's son Rehoboam messed up with the people and the, and the, and the kingdom split in two and the northern ten tribes became uh, Israel or Samaria and the southern ten tribes became Judah. Um, and, and during the, in the northern kingdom, uh, after uh, a number of kings went by, there was a king who ro rose to power uh, named Ahab. And he married Jezebel. Now, the Jews were only supposed to marry amongst the Jews, right? Didn't happen here. In fact, uh, Jezebel was a daughter of Ethbaal. That's her dad, Ethbaal. He was the king of Sidon. Uh, he was a former priest of Astarte, Asherah, Baal, false, ugly gods, Phoenician gods. Astarte being his primary uh, goddess that he was a priest of. Uh, Astarte is the goddess of love and increase. So Jezebel married Ahab, the king of Israel. And Jezebel was to the church at Thyatira, this woman that was working in the church, what Jezebel was to Ahab and to Israel. What was she like to Ahab? Well, do you remember Elijah was one of the prophets of the day? And that Jezebel had gone to Elijah after God used him mightily, and she threatened to kill him. She said she was going to kill him. Did that waver Elijah any church? You bet it did. He took off running and headed south into the wilderness, remember? She brought fear into the greatest prophet of the day. Ahab ran. She confronted him. Just talk about the power of the spirits behind her. Get a little understanding there. And she was wholly into Baal worship. She'd learned from her dad. She'd seduced her husband, who was a weak man, Ahab. And, and uh, Israel, she was using her, her, uh, her king husband 
And if you remember the northern ten tribes at that time, they had two golden calves, one at the northern border, one at the southern border. So they were, they were calf worshipers. They said that was God, Yahweh. You know, that's breaking the second commandment, isn't it? Make no graven images, make no idols for yourselves. That's what they were doing uh, before she became the queen. But then she carried them a step farther. She was moving them on into Baal worship away from Yahweh, which is breaking the first of the Ten Commandments. So she was leading Israel down farther into wickedness, degradation, and farther away from God. In fact, she was probably a priestess herself. And the Jezebel that was working many moons later in the church in Thyatira was was, uh, would, was motivated and used by the same spirit, I would guess, very same demon. She married in to the church family, be my guess. She taught false doctrine. Soon as she got there, she was living what she taught. She taught that sexual immorality was okay. Now that goes along with what we've been learning in that day uh, about... Uh, uh, other false gods and other false beliefs. Sexual immorality is okay, long as your heart is right. Mm -hmm. She also was teaching in the church uh, that they could eat meat sacrificed to idols. That was fine. That was okay. And remember what that uh, tells us? You remember that? Whenever, when they were eating meat sacrificed to idols, they were worshiping with the unbelievers which meant it was party time, you remember? That's how they worshiped. You know, so there would have been drinking, there were uh, uh, prostitutes, male and female. Uh, they called them priests and priestesses of the, uh, in the church where they worshiped. Party time, all the way. <laughs> Could you imagine that working into the church? Sexual immorality is okay. Living together with outside of marriage is okay. <clears throat> well, I was at a, I've been in two towns where there were some churches in the town that were raising funds for their church by having Vegas night. Now, if you think that's okay, we need to have a talk later on. <laughs> because there's been a lot of lives and families ruined through gambling. And why would a church want to use a Vegas night in order to, and for a fundraiser? That's the ways of another God getting in and being promoted not just tolerated, but the leadership um, promoting it in the church. Well, they were to abstain when, uh, when uh, others were eating meat uh, that was uh, sacrificed to idols, because if others saw you and they knew that you knew and that they knew, then it was like you were accepting of their ways. So to abstain from doing that, which is what Paul taught, then that would mean they would have to withdraw the believers in Thyatira from the social gatherings, from many of the social gatherings and the gatherings of the guilds, the tradespeople around town. That's where the troubles were. That's where the major sin was. That'd be like uh, if our, our teens today your, your teens come to you and one of your teenagers and says, uh, um, Susie's having this party Friday night after the ball game. Mom, I want to go. I'm going to go. <clears throat> and uh, mom says, now I know a little bit about Susie and her parents. There might be alcohol there. I've known a few families where the, the parents allowed the underage teenagers to drink as long as they stayed in the house. So mom would say, no, we follow Jesus. And you're not, oh, I'm not going to drink, mom. Oh, 
you're not going to be seen around and be among those. You will abstain from uh, eating meat that's been sacrificed out. You will abstain from that. You'll stay away. You're not going. Of course, they said, yes, Mom, and, and, and stayed home, right? <clears throat> that, would be like, uh, that would be like one of us going to a family reunion and knowing, knowing the alcohol is going to be flowing and going anyway. Like going to that wedding and ended up in a reception afterwards and you knew that they were all going to be drinking. Your, your being there is just like ex the acceptance of. <clears throat> so why is this so wrong? Why is it? This accepted lifestyle that the Thyatirans had uh, in their church, uh, this doctrine that they've been changing, uh, made me think of my early days of being saved. My old hangout in Sio used to be the pub. You know, that was the bar right uptown, right on the middle of the main street. So I got saved, and I thought, I can still hang out in the pub. I'll be a good witness to all the, all the guys there. I just won't drink. And so that's what I was doing. I was going uptown to the pub and hanging out with the guys, and I had Jimmy keep me a pitcher of cold water in the, in the fridge, and I'd still play cards and foosball and pool and, and witness to the guys there. And as uh, the weeks and then the months went by, I started feeling pretty uncomfortable, still hanging out in the pub all the time. And I was still associating myself with, and they weren't changing. There wasn't a one of them changed and came to the Lord. <laughs> and, and so, uh, Holy Spirit started working on me and says, now, now you're, just, you're just okaying their lifestyle. None of them's changing. You've already witnessed to all of them. Time for you to get out of there. <clears throat> Separate from. That's not who you are anymore, Mick. And I'm so glad. <laughs> Amen. Some of those Thyatirans who were in that group following Jezebel, you know, they were, they were committing spiritual adultery. They liked what Jezebel was doing, the new doctrine that was being promoted in the church. They liked it. Oh, my, I hope the United Methodist Church, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to swing over and change the definition of marriage and change all of our sexual morals. <laughs> the Bible is the truth, and that's what we're going to follow. Amen. So some of these people at Thyatira were actually in the spiritual, were sneaking out on God because they wanted the taste of the flesh, satisfying flesh activities. They liked those doctrines. Yeah, they're just like uh, others in the world seeking power, pleasure, fame, and fortune. You know what that kind of religion is described as? What can God do for me? You thinking about that? That's not your religion, is it? Yeah, he saves you, and then what? It's what I can do for God, right? What do you want me to do, Lord? I'm going to heaven now. So what do you want me to do for you? It's all about God. Yes. Amen. Amen. As the Thyatirans were just the opposite of the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus had a strong doctrine and a weak love. And here's a church with strong love and weak doctrine. <clears throat> and these false teachers, they knew they were teaching that which was not in the in the Holy Scriptures. They knew they were teaching different than the, than the Holy Scriptures had, and yet they were okay in it, reasoning it out anyway. Hmm. Jezebel, now it could be, Jezebel wanted to do the right things, in other words, through the church, spread goodness, but for the wrong reasons. And she thought her ways were best. Her judgment, the place of her sin, was to, to be the place of her punishment. 
her judgment, verses 21 and 22. Jesus said, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. Judgment of others in the church was coming also if they did not repent. See, there were, she was picking up others in the church. They were joining her in her spiritual adulteries. She was leading them into great trouble unless they repent. The children talked about right here would be her followers. And Jesus said her followers would die. See, Smyrna, that was the church under uh, persecution, they were to die in God's will for standing up for God. But these people, they would be, Jesus said they continue and they would die outside of God's will. You see, love, faith, and service don't excuse wrong doctrine and wrong lifestyle. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse 23, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Jesus is saying here, the rest of the churches, as they watch what I do with you and the years go by, the churches would know Jesus is Lord by what happened to those other churches. Those not condoning these false doctrines, these false teachings, and standing against them will receive no extra burden if they hold fast to the true doctrine. You can see that battle in the very same church, in that very same congregation, just like, just like uh, we have in our denomination. It takes the battle right down here, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said, I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, these deeper truths as they call them, depths of Satan actually. I will ask no nothing more of you, no extra burdens except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. Hold on tightly. And I do really believe that's, that's one word from Jesus for us today. Hold on tightly. Uh, the world around us is trying to get us to compromise what we believe in all kinds of areas, in all kinds of lifestyles. And when, when he comes, our conflict with evil will be over. Hallelujah. He said, hold on tightly what you have until I come. This is the first reference in these letters to Jesus' second coming, to the return of Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't say when he was coming, did he here? You can just hold on. Amen. Uncertainty of when. Verse 26. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, that's what it takes to be victorious, to them I will give authority over all the nations. Victorious. Keeping his works, not her works, implies lifestyle, see implies what we do with our bodies. To the end, he says, not just for a while. This is a race that you and I have to finish. In other words, we've got to keep serving Christ. We must continue to serve in the church if we can. There's no quitting. My turn's over. I did that. We'll turn that over to somebody else now. There's no retirement from church service unless you're not able. There's none of this I used to serve. It's continuing to the end. 
And then the rewards he mentions, verses 27 and 28. They will rule the nations with an iron rod, an iron scepter, and smash them like clay pots. You will break their power. They will have the same authority I received from my Father. Who will? Those who are victorious, faithful to the end. And I will also give them the morning star. So, if we stay faithful, we hold on to solid doctrine and holy lifestyle, someday we will have authority over the earth. We will rule with, along with Christ, tend with a rod of iron. Notice that this isn't a, uh, a rod of wood. This is iron. It's not going to break when he, goes, uh, when he needs to use it. A scepter of iron. He's talking about the millennium here. Jesus would rather shepherd with a pastoral rod, but there will be some, even in the, in the millennium, who force him to use the rod of iron. And we will receive, and they will receive, the morning star. That's the light which ushers out of darkness. Hallelujah. Giving himself, he's the light, that we may reflect his brightness. Thank you, Lord. Keep the Thyatiran strengths of love, faith, patience, and works, but we've also got to keep the doctrine of Jesus Christ and keep others in the church in right doctrine, right beliefs, keeping our spiritual ears tuned. Hold on tightly, church. Are we like Thyatira as a church? Are there some in our midst like Thyatira? Let's bow our heads, please. Father, we just want to hear from you. We can give you our opinions on what we think, but it really doesn't matter what we think. It's what you say. So please reveal to us what you're saying to us through this letter as a church, but also as individuals, Father God. Forgive us, Lord when we wimp out in this battle over solid doctrine and solid beliefs. Give us grace to stand strong and to lift up your truths, the truths in Holy Scripture, wherever they apply, in marriages, in family, in society, sin areas, heaven and hell, Help us to stand up for your truths. Give us grace for that in Jesus' name. We will not be the adulterous church. And the believers who agreed said, Amen. 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 We'll go to the prayer tablet here this morning. Father, we are awed that you would give so much power to our prayers. What a responsibility we have to pray. And we want to lift up uh, Ethel Beavers and her family right now who have been called in. This morning, called in the family that she might Pass on over the Jordan at any time now. We thank you for Ethel's faith, her salvation, and her service to you through this church for so many years. Oh, may they know your presence in their midst through this, through this glorious time. Thank you, Father. 
another praise. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord, things unseen and seen that you have done in our lives. Thank you for the relationship with you. Thank you for sending your Son. We agree with that praise. Thank you, Lord. We have a praise report. Uh, Mick and Joyce Morak's son, Rich, has been misdiagnosed. He does not have cancer in the lymph nodes. They are fatty tumors. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're asked to pray for good results for the uh, test that Bill Cox had a, a couple of weeks ago. Let it be so, Lord. Whatever is wrong, heal it and make it right. Give him victory. Uh, we're asked to pray for the Fuller family who sent their mother home to Christ on Thursday. Lord, fill that, fill that gap in that family with yourself. Thank you, Lord. And use this time, Lord, to cause others to think about eternity, to cause others to make sure through you of where they're going. Thank you, Lord, for the baptism celebration today, for the service today, for bringing us all together as your children and for continuing to show us the, the light, the truth, what is holy and what is not. Separate us, Lord, from the world unto yourself for your holy and righteous and good purposes so that you will gain glory now and forever. And the believers said, Amen. Amen.